1974, chemists Mario Molina and Sherwood Rowland published a groundbreaking paper in Nature. They warned that chlorofluorocarbons used in aerosols and refrigerators drift upward into the stratosphere, where they break apart ozone molecules. At the time, their claims were met with skepticism. Few believed these invisible gases could threaten the very shield that makes life on Earth possible. Eleven years later, in 1985, British scientists shocked the world when they officially documented a dramatic thinning of the ozone layer over Antarctica. What Molina and Rowland had predicted was no longer theory, it had become fact. The implications were dire. The planet's natural sunscreen, which protects people, animals, plants, and entire ecosystems from deadly ultraviolet radiation, was being destroyed at alarming speed. So what happened next? Three decades later, what has become of the ozone hole? This is the story of how humanity, when faced with catastrophe, found a way to come together. The ozone layer is one of Earth's most important shields, a thin band of gas in the stratosphere that protects life below. This layer is fragile. Its thickness shifts with the seasons and even from day to night, and its concentration varies across different regions. Ultraviolet light from the sun comes in three forms, UVC, UVB, and UVA. UVC never reaches the Earth's surface, it's completely absorbed by the atmosphere. But the other two types get through, and both can be dangerous. In fact, the sunlight around us is made up mostly of UVA about 95%, while UVB accounts for only around 5%. Still, UVB is more intense. It directly damages DNA, causes sunburns, and leads to melanoma as well as other types of skin cancer. UVA penetrates deeper into the skin, triggers oxidative stress, accelerates aging, and can also contribute to certain forms of skin cancer. Here, the ozone layer acts as Earth's natural sunscreen by filtering out nearly 98% of UVB and a significant portion of UVA radiation, it shields humans, animals, and ecosystems from the sun's destructive power. Still, its protection is not absolute. Studies have shown that even a 1% thinning of the ozone layer can increase skin cancer cases by about 3%. In the US today, roughly 3.5 million new cases are diagnosed every year. After British scientists confirmed the thinning of the ozone layer over Antarctica in 1985, alarm bells rang worldwide. NASA scientists quickly rechecked satellite data from Nimbus 7 which had been measuring ozone since 1978, and found that the instruments had indeed recorded extremely low ozone levels over Antarctica. But the computer software had been programmed to treat any readings below 180 DU as errors and discard them. As a result, the Antarctic ozone hole went unnoticed in NASA's early 1980s analyses because of a misconfigured data filter. In the rush to find answers, international expeditions were dispatched to the frozen continent. Their findings pointed to one culprit, chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCS chemicals, that had once been hailed as a technological triumph. CFCS were first developed in 1928 by chemists working for General Motors' Frigidaire division. For decades, they were considered a perfect compound. That reputation made them indispensable. By the mid-1970s, U.S. manufacturers were producing more than 750 million pounds of CFCS every year. Their popularity was immense. They were in refrigerators, air conditioners, insulating foams, solvents for electronics, and everyday spray cans. A $28 billion industry grew around them. To most people, CFCS seemed harmless, but in the stratosphere, under the force of ultraviolet radiation, these stable compounds broke apart, releasing chlorine atoms. Scientists discovered that one atom of chlorine could catalytically destroy up to 100,000 molecules of ozone before it became inactive. This mechanism matched the observations. 
The thinning ozone above Antarctica was not caused by volcanoes, as some industry representatives had suggested, but by CFCS. Suddenly, Molina and Rowland's 1974 hypothesis, dismissed for a decade as speculation or even KGB disinformation, was proven right. Industry pushback was fierce. The Chemical Manufacturers Association and companies like DuPont insisted the science was uncertain and warned against hasty regulation. In 1987, DuPont even told Congress, we believe there is no imminent crisis that requires unilateral regulation. What had once seemed like an industrial miracle was, in fact, a planetary threat. The ozone layer is measured in Dobson units, DU. A healthy level is about 300 DU, which equals roughly 3 millimeters. Just 3 millimeters of gas form the shield that makes human life on Earth possible. But starting in 1979, things began to change. That year, the lowest recorded levels dropped to 194 DU, already close to record lows. By 1982, the minimum had fallen to 173 DU, and in 1983 to just 154. In 1985, it sank again to 124 DU. The downward trend continued. By 1991, ozone concentrations dipped below 100 DU for the first time, and in 1994, the record was shattered. On September 30th, values plummeted to only 73 DU. What makes the situation even more alarming is the chemistry behind it. Chlorine released from chlorofluorocarbons has an exceptionally long lifetime in the atmosphere. A single CFC molecule can persist for 50 to 150 years before it breaks down. By the late 1980s, measurements showed the ozone hole widening at a dramatic pace. Policymakers faced growing pressure, not only from scientists, but also from the public, alarmed by the health and ecological risks. Although industrial lobbyists resisted, the Montreal Protocol was negotiated in 1987 and enforced starting in 1989. It remains the only treaty ratified by every nation on Earth, an extraordinary example of multilateral cooperation. Over the next two decades, amendments strengthened the agreement, and by 2010, the global production of CFCS had ceased entirely. Monitoring data confirmed the turnaround, the ozone layer is on a recovery path. Current projections from the United Nations and the World Meteorological Organization suggest a return to pre-1980 levels between 2040 and 2066, depending on the region. The ozone story demonstrates two key lessons, that human activity can destabilize planetary systems and that coordinated international policy can restore them. It is both a cautionary tale and a model of success in global environmental governance.